awesome seminar today, all centered around Tiki. And we have, there's, in my opinion, two, no better people to be speaking about this today. Um, and I want to shout out quickly just our sponsors. So our, our Nova Scotia Liquor Corporation in our province, we have a monopoly ran through the government and they're um, a big advocate of what we're doing here. Um, the World uh, Wine and Spirits Education Trust, the Canadian Professional, Professional uh, Bartenders Association, uh, Sovereign Wine and Spirits, and also Abwa Kashasa, who we have some, um, some of the reps in here and ambassadors in the room. So uh, I'm gonna just turn it over to, uh, to Evan McNeil to chat quickly. We also have Nathan Whitehouse in the house looking like you're coming from somewhere and uh, it's got some sun and beauty. So uh, Evan, if you wanna just chat a little bit about Agua and, and, uh, and where you could find it in Nova Scotia. Absolutely, so uh, thanks for joining everyone. Uh, my name is Evan McNeil, I'm the Territory Manager for Sovereign Canada, uh, a liquor agency here in, in, in the country and I'm the kind of spread across New Brunswick, Newfoundland, PEI, and, and live in Halifax myself. I actually am just a few blocks down the road right now from Matt. Uh, but uh, Avo Cachaca uh, is one of the brands uh, within the family portfolio of Sovereign. And I'm super proud and, and happy to work with them. And I was happy that we could be a part of, of the seminar, especially. Um, I was extremely excited. It was only actually about two weeks ago. Uh, Avo Cachaca Amberana joined uh, the NSLC uh, shelves um, with uh, the Avo Cachaca Prata. So there's currently two, two SKUs available in Nova Scotia, the Prata and the Amberana. Currently the Amberana is just in the port store for anyone who lives in Halifax. Uh, it's the downtown kind of flagship store, but Prata is uh, in 15 stores across uh, the province right now. So, and it's also in New Brunswick and, uh, and a few bars in Newfoundland right now. So. Uh, just glad to be a part of the seminar. So thanks for joining, guys. Yeah, thanks, Evan. Um, so with no further ado, I'd just like to introduce who we're going to be having uh, speaking today. Um, first, we have Brother Cleve, um, you know, a musician, a DJ, a bartender, a writer, um, jack of all trades, spent the last 35 years traveling around the world making music and also making drinks, from what I hear. He had a cocktail epiphany in Cleveland, Ohio in 1985 which is documented in Robert uh, Simpson's book, A Proper Drink, and be began collecting cocktail books and lost spirits while touring with rock bands. He actually um, has a connection to Halifax. So, Brother Cleve, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, in the, uh, I think it was uh, around 1991 or 1992, I was playing with a, uh, an R&B soul singer named Barron's Whitfield. Uh, Barron's Whitfield and the Savages, who had been around since the 80s, uh, I worked with him for about five or six years, and we got invited to play the Halifax Jazz and Rhythm and Blues Festival uh, that year. So the, uh, the, I guess the Canadian government flew us up first class, which was quite nice. Uh, we were able to have drinks on the plane for free at uh, eight o'clock in the morning, always good, and uh, got up there and... Uh, my wife and I, uh, my wife came as well, and uh, we, we stayed in Halifax, uh, for an extended amount of time since we were up there. And I was quite pleased uh, to see that I, uh, I was actually making money up there. Cleves Sporting Goods uh, was a store that I found uh, downtown. <laughs> I don't know if it's still there because I haven't been up there since 1992. Yeah, it's there. I'd it's gone, there. gone in and tried to collect some money while I was there. But, uh, but beyond all that, a beautiful, beautiful city. And uh, we, we really enjoyed ourselves. And it's actually not that far from where we live here in Boston, we could drive to Portland, Maine and take a, a boat over. Uh, so uh, maybe we'll do that. If, unfortunately, right now, I'm, I, my uh, restaurant has reopened uh, after three months of being closed and uh, I'm working 12 hours a day. I'm gonna go right to work from, from here. I'm working 12 hours a day because we are just packed with people that are just getting hammered because they're out in public drinking, which they haven't been able to do actually since last summer. So, uh, but as far as outdoors, I mean, so how yeah, the I love it. See you, really, see you soon. Really appreciate. I'm sure that when you came before that cocktail culture hadn't, it probably didn't exist here. Probably a lot of spice rums and in diet Coke at that time. Um, and you know, I now, Diet Coke, but yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, now it's uh, we have a big connection, a close connection to Boston, actually, for all that you don't don't know. We had a large explosion here uh, in 1917 that basically leveled our city. Um, and the first people to come and help were uh, Bostonians. Um, so they came up and, and helped. And every year we now bring uh, a Christmas tree to Boston. And there's a Christmas tree lighting in the Boston Commons every single year. Halifax kind of their gift to, to Boston. So we have a, a close connection with Boston and we really appreciate you, uh, you joining us today um, here. And hopefully we can get you to Jazz Fest in the coming years. Sounds good. Um, and secondly, we have uh, Shannon Mustfer, super excited from the big, uh, big city of New York. So anybody here from New York, uh, stand up. Uh, she's a consultant, a spirits educator, and a um, lovely person. I've just got to meet her over the last couple of weeks and um, also an author of Tiki Modern Tropical Cocktails, um, which you can purchase right now at um, Cocktail Emporium in Toronto. It's just cocktailemporium.com, all one word. And the reason I'm pointing you to a Canadian site is because um, all of the proceeds that um, are from the sales of this book go to uh, Black Women in Motion, which is a group out of um, Toronto, um, and it's a youth-led organization that empowers and supports the advancement of black women and survivors of sexual violence. So um, we thought it was um, really important for Drink Atlantic to highlight um, young black leaders, young black authors um, in this time where um, so eloquently Shannon put it that, you know, we've had some choppy waves um, along the way. So um, not only an author, a really rad bartender, uh, you can find her at Gladys. Um, and I would in encourage you to go hang out. I can't wait to be able to travel, to be able to head over to Gladys to, ch to, uh, to check her out. So, um, Shannon, if you could, um, give us a little recap on how maybe you met brother Cleve. I hear there's a connection there. Yes. And, uh, before I get into that, I just want to say, Hey, I'm at a loss of words. I don't know how to follow up that, uh, glowing introduction. Thank you for that. <laughs> and uh, B, uh, yes, I mean, uh, I've expressed this to Pete, I've expressed this to Brother Cleve, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing right now were not for me being at the first Tiki by the Sea, seeing Brother Cleve's seminar, the light bulb went off, and I said to myself, and this is six years ago, mind you, so there's a little more history behind that, but I have the best rum selection in Brooklyn, if not all of NYC, to execute tiki cocktails from a historical perspective. And I was like, I, I got to do it. I don't, I don't really have a choice. So with that being said, I'm really grateful to be here at Gladys. It's been a wonderful experience thus far, and we're keeping on, keeping on. We're doing to-go cocktails. If you're in Brooklyn, stop by and pick some up. Um, but yeah, I mean... It feels very full circle to be here right now presenting uh, back to back with Brother Cleve, which I'm really excited about. Yeah, we are too. So I'm I'm gonna um, I'm gonna stop talking, and as you guys can tell, I can I, I don't have a problem talking. So uh, I'm gonna stop and let let the real stars uh, shine here. Um, Shannon's gonna take us through a little bit of a, a welcome cocktail. Um, typically, when you come to a Drink Atlantic cocktail event, you'll have a welcome drink in your hand. Um, and we wanted you to, to you know, it's going to be, you're going to get thirsty. You're going to crave some great tropical drinks while you're listening to this, I'm sure. So um, you may not have all the ingredients at home and that's okay. Uh, you can make some substitution. Um, my, my great friend and uh, business partner, Jeff here is actually white, working on a Sidewinders Fang for us while we uh, can enjoy this, uh, this great seminar. So Shannon's going to take us through a little bit of a welcome cocktail and then we're going to get right into it. Brother Cleve's going to map out the history and we're going to take it right from there so uh the stage is is yours shannon and thanks again for everybody for coming um make sure to check out drinkatlantic.com for seminars that are going forward all right so with that being said um i'm gonna riff off of one of my favorite uh tiki cocktails not only for how it tastes but also for kind of like a, how i see it as a bridge between you know, classic, traditional tiki, historical tiki, and then a revival of it, okay? So this cocktail is called the Magpie. 
Um, some of you might be familiar with this bird. If you're not, it's a really kind of fun bird. It um, is very creative in that it will gather all these disparate elements to build these really colorful nests. And it's really fun to watch what they do. So this is inspired by that notion of taking disparate, maybe unexpected elements and then creating something kind of quirky and weird, but super cool. All right, so why am I referencing the jungle bird? Let's uh, walk back a little bit. Um, our understanding is that the jungle bird was the last tropical or tiki drink that had some major traction. And we think the ETA on it was like 1979, coincidentally a year after I was born at the uh, Kuala Lumpur Hilton. And it's really simple. I love that it's a mashup of two very classic and iconic drinks, the Dakiri and the Negroni, all right? So in this cocktail, you have aged rum, usually blackstrap is involved, pineapple, lime, and Campari. Can't really go wrong there. Um, thankfully, we had an opportunity to revisit this drink, I want to say in the mid the late 90s, you guys uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I got it off, when Giuseppe Gonzalez, formerly of Dutch Kills, and, you know, he had Suffolk Arms here in New York before he moved to Las Vegas, Giuseppe, thank you for everything. I was a regular at Dutch Kills when it opened, so I have a very personal connection not only to this cocktail and to, you know, where it comes from from a mixology perspective, but also um, to Giuseppe and how he helped to bring this cocktail back to light, which I believe was like the the moment it opened the floodgates for people that want to do uh, tropical drinks again and feel like they were legitimate. So with no further ado, um, this cocktail is taking cues from the original. Uh, we'll get into my philosophy on why I make these choices a little bit later. But the idea is what are the flavors that you find in those original ingredients and what kind of ingredients do we have now that weren't available at that time that we can use to kind of stretch and innovate and I would like to say finesse this idea and make something super cool. All right, so Mad Pie, three quarter ounce lime juice, one ounce of carrot. We'll get into why we're using carrot a little bit later. Half an ounce of papaya syrup. We're not going to ditch the Campari, but we will dial it back a bit. I'm going to do a little under three quarters of an ounce. So it's a matter of taste whether you want to use the unaged. Kasasa, I'm going to do Ambrana for today, just to give it a little heft, two ounces. So the wonderful benefit of using, you know, the Ambrana is that when you look at our original recipe, it's usually a Jamaica rum or a black shirt rum or a combination of the two. Um, and the unifying theme is that you got funk and body. Um, and you get both of those here in the uh, Amberana. So it goes without saying, you got to shake it to wake it. And to those of you who are tuning in from another time zone where it's 9 o'clock, this will be an eye-opener. So I appreciate you being here. Now, it goes without saying that um, you want the coldest glass where you can possibly muster for any cocktail. The colder everything is, the better. So I'm going to strain this over a few large rocks. Then I'm going to top it with some pebbles. And so what you're seeing here is it's really bright. Well, maybe you can't see it on the angle, but 
the whole idea is that it still kind of lives in the realm of a jungle bird, really bright, very refreshing, um, beautiful, enticing. But I added kind of like a health kick to it because I think cachaca and health go hand in hand. We'll talk about that later. Now I'm going to finish it with a garnish. Real easy. I kind of think of this like a really fun brunch cocktail. So pineapple leaves are great if you have them. And if you don't, you know, just put a nice orange slice on it. Add something fun to look at here. And then of course you need a straw so you can enjoy it. So guys, welcome and thank you. Cheers, Shannon, that looks unbelievable. Don't be jealous. Okay. <laughs> Guys, the Amberana is shining through. You're getting a lot of wood notes. You're getting um, some kind of earthy, dusky notes. And that's why I chose the carrot and the papaya to harmonize with the elements of the wood that the Amberana spends time in. And the whole idea is like so light and bright, but you get a little substance here as well. Shannon, we have a, a, a question uh, from someone. Uh, what's your specs on the papaya syrup? Half an ounce, but. I'm, I'm glad you asked the question because I use papaya puree and depending on what puree you are able to access, be it, you know, via pack rim, waran, uh, purple puree, they might be a little different in terms of sweetness or acidity. So maybe you do like a half to half ratio of sugar syrup in your puree, or maybe it's going to be a little different, but it's up to you to determine um, how much sweetness you want out of that syrup. Yeah, and I, I can only speak for, for Canada because of how, how difficult it is to get fr tropical fruit. But one, one uh, hack is you can, uh, if you use frozen fruit, um, you, you generally will have higher bricks content. But uh, thanks, Emilio, for asking that. So we'll pass it off back, back to Matt there. Yeah, that looks delicious. And I'm sure that um, some of you may not be able to make a cocktail as quickly as Shannon can or some bartenders. So if you look in the chat, Evan, uh, if you click the chat function, Evan has put um, a, a PNG of the recipe there and a picture of it. Um, after the seminar as well, we'll send you all an email with recipes that we did today and uh, where you can find Shannon's book with even more recipes. I just ordered mine today, so I can't wait for it to get in the mail. Um, so yeah, we're going to move on and, uh, brother Cleve is going to take us through the history of Tiki and I'm so excited to learn more about this. So it's all yours, brother Cleve. All right. Well, first up, a shout out to Agua Cachaca and for the last, uh, well, haven't done it yet this year, but for the last six years, I've been opening the Tiki by the Sea event that we, uh, we've been doing in Wildwood, New Jersey and in the Fragene Beach in Roma, Italy. And we always like to start off with the official Tiki by the Sea invocation, which will make you hangover proof for the next 24 hours. Now, we're going to not do the entire thing right now. It's a call and response, and obviously, I can't hear you respond, but we like to open with a little aloha. See, you can read it right. Where All right. There it is. Aloha. All right. Okay. And how about a little aloha? Aloha. Okay. Ready? Aloha. <laughs> the challenge is taken. Aloha. <laughs> Ah. <laughs> okay, yes, all right, we are ready to roll. Tiki, the rise, the fall, the resurrection, the redemption! Yes! All right, so our, uh, the prelude to this starts in 1898, when uh, Hawaii, the island nation in the Pacific Ocean, became an American territory, mostly for military purposes at the time, but it sort of opened it up and by 1908, there was a Hawaii mania going on in the United States, mostly centered on college campuses, where, for instance, the ukulele became like the biggest selling instrument at the time. Hawaiian music, sheet music, and the songs, the hapahole, and, and other 
that type of music and on 78 RPM records, the, uh, those ethnic recordings as uh, they would be sold by people like uh, RCA Victor at the time and Decca, uh, these became big bestsellers. So this whole sort of Hawaii enters the mainstream America consciousness around, like I say, 1908 up to uh, the, uh, well, Prohibition uh, kind of put a little uh, dagger into that uh, at the end of the, uh, the teens there. But our story really starts, uh, well, it starts in 1907 when a gentleman named Ernest Raymond Beaumont Gant, a Texan Cajun, was born in Mejia, Texas. Uh, just as a side note, the father of exotica music, Les Baxter, was also born in Mejia, Texas. Quite a coincidence. Uh, Mejia is a small town outside of Waco just for those of you who may be geographically challenged. But our Ernest Raymond Beaumont Gant is known to us as Don the Beachcomber. So I'll just call him Don from now on. Ernest Raymond Beaumont Gant is too much of a mouthful. But uh, Don, uh, in 1925, Don's grandfather was a wildcatter in Texas at the, uh, in the early 20th century. A wildcatter was somebody that would go around with a tiny uh, oil rig uh, and uh, would find oil and then would either buy the land and resell it to like the John D. Rockefellers of the world or would uh, lease the land, things like that. But, but essentially made a lot, a lot of money uh, in Texas and Oklahoma in those days. So uh, when Don turned 18, which was in 1925, his uh, grandfather said, well, look, I have uh, money uh, earmarked for you for your college education if you want to go to college. If not, perhaps you would like to just take the money and travel around the world and educate yourself. That's what Don did. So he left uh, from the port of New Orleans in 1925 and made his way uh, down to uh, Havana, Cuba was his, uh, his first stop, where he uh, sampled the Daikari down in uh, places like Sloppy Joe's. I think we got a little Sloppy Joe book here. Yeah, Sloppy Joe's used to publish their annual bartending guides uh, that you could buy. This is the 1931 edition of it, and uh, just a little profusely illustrated with uh, you know little line drawings of the the drinks and everything. But uh, he really enjoyed that. Don't forget, 1925 prohibition in the United States has been going on for six years, so uh, he may have been drinking uh, illicitly in the U.S probably was, but uh, he could uh, do it anywhere he liked down there. But from, uh, from Cuba, he headed to Jamaica, which was where Don had his real epiphany there. He had uh, the uh, planter's punch, which is basically a, a daiquiri made with uh, you know, a heavy Jamaican style rum. Lots of hogo, lots of funk. That one changed his, his life. He was, that's, that's it. That's my drink. I love that drink. And if you look at uh, the entire list, we'll say, of Don's drinks, most of them, that, that's the starting point of them. And they're, they're kind of builds from there. But from there on, Don traveled around through the, the Caribbean. He never left uh, a, a biography or, or anything. But we could tell from his, his drinks, anyway, that he went to Trinidad and uh, Barbados and uh, Martinique, Guadeloupe. We know he went to Guyana because he discovered Demerara rum there, and a lot of dr his drinks had the Demerara rum, especially the uh, Lemon Heart 151. Uh, traveled through uh, Panama and then went to Oceania. Uh, we do know that he went to Tahiti and Polynesia in general. Uh, he did go over to Australia uh, and through Southeast Asia and uh, to places like Macau and Hong Kong in China. Uh, but Don's real total then epiphany was in, uh, in the Philippines. Because what had happened was Don had tasted all these different rums along the way. And Don had an incredible palate. And he was able to really uh, remember these, these different flavor profiles for all these things. And he had this idea of combining these. You know, maybe if I did this and this and you know whatever, I, it, it might be interesting to, uh, to see what it would do to have layers of rums. But when he got to the Philippines, they did something there that he had never seen before which was the layering of fruit juices. So and on your street vendors, you would find uh, people just selling 
not, uh, you know, and like in the, the United States, we'll say you might have grown up with a glass of orange juice, grapefruit juice, something of, of that sort. But here they were mixing like, you know, coconut and, and pineapple and guava and uh, calamansi, which is a, a fruit that uh, until recently is only grown in the Philippines. They, they are growing it in California now. But uh, all these different things like that that would be layered in these uh, just cups that you would get uh, that would be fresh uh, squeezed uh, right on the street at the at the vendor sugarcane juice as well so he started thinking maybe if I combined this type of thing with these different rums and maybe some of the, the uh, syrups that he had found like orgeat in uh, Martinique and uh, falernum down in Trinidad Barbados uh, you know we could maybe do something really interesting here so th he let this thought sort of uh, thicken in his brain. He got to Hawaii and by the time he got to Hawaii, he, he ran out of, out of all of his grandfather's money. So he ended up leaving there. And uh, instead of going back to, to New Orleans or to Texas, he continued on just kind of straight over to Los Angeles. Now in Los Angeles, he had been collecting a lot of uh, flotsam and jetsam as we'll say uh, throughout uh, Southeast uh, Asia and Polynesia, Oceania. And he had all sorts of stuff that would, he could actually rent out to movie studios who by the early 1930s, this was about 1929 that Don made it back to, uh, to the mainland. So he had all this stuff that he was able to rent out to the Hollywood studios who were in the midst of doing all these sort of jungle epics, the Tarzan movies, for instance, and, and other films like that, Paradise Lost and things. So he had all these like fish balls and sort of, uh, decorative uh, things that he had brought with him. Uh, so he met a lot of uh, folks in that field in Hollywood. He also became a bootlegger. He's got a job in Chinatown of all places. Now you have to re realize that in the late 20s, early 30s, Chinatown was not a place where um, we'll say uh, Caucasians or Americans in, in general were going to. These were oh, really just for Asians who spoke the languages, who uh, knew the food, even though it had been kind of Americanized. This is Cantonese uh, food. So, uh, but he probably had picked up some uh, Chinese language skills along the way, or oceanic skills of the various languages, uh, and worked as a dishwasher there and busboy, uh, and started selling liquor out the back door, because uh, Chinatown was not something that, a place which was heavily policed. So by the time, Prohibition ends in uh, December 5th, 1933. He's been making all sorts of connections and he's figured out a lot to what he wants to do with these drinks and with the, the food. And he decides it's time he can open his own uh, place. So in uh, early January, I believe it was the 14th of January, 1934, basically about six weeks after Prohibition has ended, he opens Don's Cafe in Hollywood, soon to be renamed Don the Beachcomber. And he assumes this name he legally changed his name later to Don Beach, but uh, that was his Don the Beachcomber, and he would wear these you know, Hawaiian shirts and just walk around in sandals and, and shorts. And uh, the place was mobbed. It was very small at first, but it, it brought in the entire Hollywood connection. All these movie stars would just couldn't wait to get in there, they would wait in line to get in. There were only like four seats at the bar, and there were about six two tops or four tops in the place. He did eventually move across the street to a larger location in 1937, uh, where that remained uh, until 1989 when it closed. But the thing was, you have to remember a couple of things here. So these drinks take off like crazy because nobody's ever, ever had a drink like this before. They didn't exist. He created it. If you think of pre-prohibition cocktails, you're gonna see a lot of uh, whiskey, and gin, some brandy. Rum had actually gone out of favor in the United States uh, in the late 1700s, early 1800s. It kind of, you know, it, it had a couple of hundred year history uh, as the number one spirit, but whiskey that was started to be created in uh, Pennsylvania around 18, I'm sorry, 1750, uh, really became a lot more popular, uh, rye whiskey at that era. And you know, your classic cocktails like the uh, Manhattan, we'll say, of the uh, uh, 1872, you know, is, is rye whiskey and vermouth, which had just come over from Italy at the time, and Angostura bitters, which were also in 1882. Uh, so 
nobody's had rum drinks. Why did Don pick rum? Well, prohibition. Whiskey takes years to age. There's really no whiskey around. Gin, <clears throat> people drank bathtub gin in, uh, during prohibition. They didn't really want to have any more gin. Vodka, tequila, didn't exist in the United States at that time, or uh, vodka maybe in very small areas of uh, Russian or Polish uh, people, like in Chicago, you would find some of that. But uh, none of these things really existed. So rum was cheap and plentiful. You could get it from the Caribbean. It was the easy, uh, you know, easy to import. And uh, so he made all these different drinks with, with these and stuff. So nobody ever had anything like this before. And it just exploded in popularity. And of course, they all had cool names like the Shark's Tooth and the QB Cooler and the Missionary's Downfall, the Test Pilot, uh, the Cobra's Fang, uh, Navy Grog, three, well, Three Dots on the Dash was the 1940s uh, drink that was uh, uh, the Morse code for victory. Uh, but then, you know, his, his most famous drink at the time uh, was the zombie. And I always like to say it like a zombie, even if I'm in a bar and I just say, I'll have a zombie, please. So the zombie was a very interesting drink. Uh, Don created the greatest marketing scheme of any bartending legend of any, of any time frame. Limit two per customer, it said right on the menu. Sorry, you can only have two. I will not serve you more than two. People are clamoring for the third one. They're going outside, coming back in. Hey, what's happening? I'll have a zombie, please. Nope, 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 nope. Don't fuck with me. You can't have that. So the zombie uh, a New York restaurateur named Monty Prozer heard about this. You know, there was no internet back then either. So uh, he read about it in a newspaper or on a trade magazine or something like that and went out to Hollywood to see what all the fuss was about. And uh, the zombie, he just fell in love with the zombie. So he brought it back to New York City and uh, renamed his restaurant on Broadway, uh, Monty Prozer's Beachcomber, home of the zombie. Yes. In 1939, the New York World's Fair opened in 3940 World's Fair, and uh, where people, millions of people came from across the world to, to go to this great fair in the great city of New York. And Monty had a Monty's Zombie Land, a uh, zombie bar, and uh, people having the zombie. Now, next thing you know, millions of people find out about the zombie. And then you start seeing, if you research and go through old cocktail menus from the mostly from the 1940s uh, and, and into the 50s, you will see a zombie on all of these uh, at the time. You will see zombies on, on tons and tons of menus at the time. The trick though to all of this is nobody knew how to make a zombie. Don steamed the labels off of all of his bottles. Even his bartenders didn't even know. They kind of figured it out after a while. And I should mention here that Don only hired Filipinos to be bartenders in his uh, iconic restaurant. So, because uh, he felt obviously that they knew how to just do this balance of all these different things together. But essentially it was on a line, just like in a, like a cooks have in a restaurant. First person would pour the spirit, second person pour the modifier, Third person would do the icing, the shaking. Fourth person would do the garnishing and hand it off to the server who would bring it out. The Maikai in Fort Lauderdale, you'll still, that is what still goes on. You walk into the Molokai bar in the Maikai. You'll, the first thing you'll notice, besides the, uh, the, the waitress is wearing coconuts and craft skirts, but the, the first thing you'll notice is there's no liquor on the bar because all the drinks are made in the back. And if you can get the tour through the, the facility, you will see that in the back room, which has all sorts of ancient, like 1950s bottles that was, have been there since uh, Mariano Lucadine originally opened the place in uh, 1957. Uh, old bottles of Bacardi, we'll say, pre-Castro, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that's another story entirely. So Don the Beachcomber then really, really takes off. By 1936, which is before Monty Prozer, a guy named uh, Victor Jules Bergeron, who had a, uh, a little barbecue place up in Oakland, California called Hinky Dinks. He comes down and he has some drinks there and he's like, wow, well, I know how to do barbecue. Don, of course, has already taken the Chinese food that he had been selling in Chinatown and now bringing this to, uh, to the masses here with, uh, you know, some touches and calling it Polynesian food. None of this is authentic. None of, nothing has anything to do with, with anything. This is Hollywood. 
This is all Hollywood, the drinks, the food, the decor. It's a dreamscape, okay? So uh, it's, it's just meant for uh, a place you can never be. This is the first theme restaurant in, in the United States too, or, or in the world, because ethnic food beforehand you would find in the places where, where it was made outside of you know, Chinese food in the United States and the occasional, uh, you know, as the Italians came in and the Russians, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so Victor Jules Bergeron, uh, he starts, uh, he decides to change his name to Trader Vic, and he, he goes down to uh, Cuba, and he has daiquiris down there at Sloppy Joe's, and uh, he's transformed by this. Uh, so if you look at the list of all of Vic's drinks, they're basically all riffs on a, on a daiquiri. And... Uh, also, Don, um, Vic's idea of using a sour, making a sour, was based on his French-Canadian heritage, which was the fact of using orgeat and lemon juice and sometimes orange juice as well to create his sour. So uh, almost all of his drinks, the, the Mai Tai being an exception, he has lime juice and, and orgeat in there. But uh, the great uh, listing of all of his drinks, which uh, Beach Bumberry, Martin Duderoff, uh, Tiki app that you can get on for your phone and tablet. Um, highly recommended. It has pretty much every Tiki Polynesian tropical drink at your <laughs> fingertips there. $9.99. Tell him Brother Cleves on you. Okay. Uh, Victor, Victor's a fascinating guy. I highly recommend that if you're, uh, you want to just read a really good story, you should read his autobiography, Frankly Speaking, in which he tells, uh, well, he has the whole story of, of how he created the Mai Tai in here. Vic published his own cocktail books, the first one in 1946, but he never divulged the recipe uh, to the Mai Tai uh, until this one. You know, uh, Don never divulged any of them. Uh, his ex-wife put a book together, uh, I don't know, 10 years or, or so ago. Uh, Hawaii Tropical Drinks and Cuisine, uh, which is pretty good. It does have all the, the drinks in there, but uh, Vic was uh, much more of an entrepreneur. He would even sell his own spirits. Here's a great uh, Trader Vic's Flaming Brandy. This is from the 1950s. This is what I like to call dead guy's booze that I got from a dead guy. And uh, after he died, of course, but uh, I haven't even opened this one. It's uh, this is it's only 100 proof, so uh, it's probably pretty good. But someday we'll, we'll open it. Maybe when all of you come to my house. This is my home bar, by the way, and uh, you can't all fit in here. But the living room is right next door. That's where the hi-fi is. Music and cocktails is the name of my game. All right, Trader Vic, 1936 uh, Hinky Dinks. He uh, and by 1937 he's got a full-blown bar there, and uh, and getting tons and tons of customers. By the mid 40s, he's got the, the Mai Tai uh, and other classic cocktails that he's created. And then uh, by, the, uh, by the 1950s, he is, he is spread out, uh, starting around 1948. He gets a deal with the uh, uh, Hilton hotel chain and uh, puts Trader Vic's all, all around the world. There's still 16 of them, mostly in, uh, in Asia. Uh, and uh, there's one in London and one in Munich, and of course Emeryville uh, outside of San Francisco on the uh, on the bay opposite uh, Oakland, and in Atlanta, Georgia. Those are the last two that are left in the U.S. I used to go to the Trader Vic's in Boston back in the '70s because I am an old motherfucker. But uh, that was a great experience, and I'm glad I was able to uh, to have that. Uh, so Trader Vic. By the early 1940s, and especially after the Second World War ends, Tiki Polynesian tropical restaurants start to explode. They're getting everywhere. Uh, Stephen Crane, who's like the third uh, of the Holy Trinity, we'll say, of uh, Tiki entrepreneurs. Steve Crane is the, the next one because in 1953, he opens the Luau in Beverly Hills on Rodeo Drive. Yep, it's the first really high class of these restaurants. <clears throat> Not to say that any of them were Excuse me. These are not places where you would go in and, uh, you know, in your shorts and T-shirt uh, like people just do today and going anywhere. But you, these were formal restaurants. You would go in dressed for a night out and uh, they were not inexpensive either uh, to get all these fabulous drinks and the, and the food at them. So uh, he opens that in Rodeo Drive. Uh, Stephen later opened the Contiki Ports 
uh, which was in the uh, Sheridan hotels. This is one of the original mugs uh, from the Contiki ports. Uh, I used to go to, there was one in Boston through the early 80s that I used to uh, go to quite often. Uh, my mother was a big fan uh, there too, although we never went together. Uh, one of those places that opened was the place where I first had a tiki drink in 1950, the Kowloon uh, in Saugus, Massachusetts, about uh, 15 miles north of Boston. I was 17 years old, uh, and they gave me a scorpion bowl because life was different in the 70s, I'll tell you that. But I had been playing with my rock band. I started playing music professionally at age 15 in bars, getting paid. And uh, my rock band at the time was playing a high school prom at the, the Kowloon. And at the end of it, they gave us a, a poo poo platter and a couple of scorpion bowls. Everybody else in the band was over 21, but uh, I was 17. But I drank that and I said, you know what? I want to drink one of these drinks every day for the rest of my life. And I've been pretty damn successful at that, I'll tell you what. All right, Tiki history continues through the 19 late 1940s post-war blow up. So uh, things like Thor Heyerdahl, the Norwegian explorer who decided to build a raft and go from uh, Lima, Peru and uh, on his way to Easter Island and over to the Cook Islands to prove that it could have happened. Why were there uh, Moais on Easter Island, which is off the coast of, of Peru and Chile in South America? How did they get there, this long, this great distance? And he proved you could, these people could have done it on a raft. These were seafaring people that lived on all these islands in Oceania. So that uh, helped to spread it. There was a, a Broadway show and a book, Book Tales of the South Pacific, a Broadway show called South Pacific, which was, uh, you know, just a huge thing. A lot of uh, folks who had been uh, in the war in the South Pacific, you know, came back with, uh, trying to have more fond memories of what happened there than the bad memories of being in a war. So things that were a bit more escapist, like this idea of an island, a dream island called Bali High is calling. Come to me, come to me. So this was uh, a huge, huge success. You start seeing, uh, wait a minute, pardon me one second. I wish that was wrong, but I gotta go to work after this. Okay, so. Uh, movies start being uh, made, uh, some of the old films, noir, you will see tiki scenes and scenes in tiki bars. Uh, Walt Disney opens Disneyland uh, and has the, um, the, the tiki, 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 tiki room, the motherfucking tiki, 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 tiki room. Yeah. So uh, that is still making it explode even more, even more. And uh, what really happened, oh, Exotica Music, Les Baxter, who I mentioned earlier, all of a sudden, people have all these records and they can have backyard luau's in their own home with this Urzat soundtrack of this exotica music which is uh, you know created in Hollywood by Les Baxter uh, basically a, a mix of jazz and uh, and different types of drums and, and uh, percussion instruments from tro tropical uh, locales and uh, and just really cool to have on and, you know, vibraphones and things like that. So you could uh, have that while you have your tiki party in your backyard. Uh, but then in 1959, Hawaii becomes a state and the 50th state, in fact, and Hawaii mania explodes. Don the Beachcomber has already gone back. This is a menu from Hawaiian village that he opened in Honolulu in 1954. Uh, and uh, I always love this menu because he has the before sundown drinks and the after sundown and the much later drinks and basically you would be hammered by like one o'clock in the afternoon test pilot don recommends no more than two zombie don will not serve more than two to each person uh you know rum barrel uh, limited to two per person uh, don's own plant is limited to two per person it just it just goes like that all the way and and if you're if you're hungry don't worry because you can have a uh, where, where was it here? oh yeah the monkey on a stick Mm-mm, good, yeah. So, uh, let's see, let me just get some of this stuff out of here. So Hawaii, and if you go to Hawaii, which is now, you know, you don't need a passport, you can use the Yankee dollar while you're there. And uh, if you're leaving the, you know, you're at the airport, you can get a books like these, uh, Okole Maluna, which means cheers, bottoms up in the Hawaiian language. And uh, these are great little guides 
I don't know why, this, this is like a representation of Kali, which is a, a Hindu goddess. Uh, don't ask me why they did that. But my favorite part of these books is the, the guide, the drink guide. So if you can focus in on these three guys here, if you can see that, I can't see it because I'm holding it up, but there's the, fir the first guy is like the, so this is the, to each drink, you have this next to each drink. This is like, oh yeah, that's nice. I like that one. This guy, he's like, yeah, yeah. I like this. One. This guy though, he's like, yeah, that's the drinks I start with, and I recommend that you do too. Okay, so more of these places are just opening up, opening up, opening up everywhere. Every city in America seems to have one. Even Chinese restaurants have taken their drinks and, and made them all these different just using the names. Nobody knows how to make them, but they're using the names anyway. Yeah, you know, zombie. Well, I mean zombie, it's gotta have at least, you know, an ounce of 151 wrong. Right? So, and things, you know, get kind of, every place is starting to look the same. There's a place called Orchids of Hawaii in the Bronx, and this is their catalog uh, that I got, I don't know, 30 some odd years ago. And everybody's got the same mugs, you know, you can just buy these for, uh, you know, 30, $33 a case. Uh, and uh, there's, uh, you know, all the bamboo, and, uh, here, you know, here's your, your swizzle sticks, nothing like what we have nowadays, of course, but it became very uniform. And by the late 1960s, early 70s, things start to change on the, we'll say the Asian food landscape, uh, Szechuan and Hunan Chinese food get introduced. And uh, Rocky um, Aioli down in, not Aioli, uh, his last name just went right on my mind, but Bisuteki, those Japanese restaurants go, oh, yeah, 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 chop, 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 flying everywhere, piece of the pork and stuff, uh, and cook at the table there. These become new, and tiki is kind of tacky at this point. And a lot of these places start to fall by the wayside. People are going, it's like, oh, do I want to have more of that fake uh, Polynesian food when I can have some nice spicy Szechuan or some Japanese? Of course, sushi bars start to open uh, in the mid to late 70s. Uh, in the United States and uh, and globally, and uh, I remember uh, actually being in, in Montreal and having some for the, the very first time up there, probably in 1973, 1974. Uh, so the decline and the fall starts to to happen at this point. By the by, the late 70s and early 80s, a lot of places are just going out of business or, or they've just, or they redecorated, they've re, revamped and got rid of all the cool decor uh, that would, would have been in them at the time. There was a place I used to go to, the Aku Aku, uh, downtown Boston, that, uh, you know, had a, a fish tank all around the, the bar, illuminated with all sorts of tropical fish in it. And it was great. You would sit there. It was really cool. But I remember by 1982, I, I went in there and like the whole thing was full of algae and the fish were basically floating and I was like, this place ain't going to be here much longer. And it, it was not. So, uh, you know, what, uh, what happens? After, how did we get to where we are today? Well, it really, the, the story starts with uh, people of a certain generation. That would be, and I'm on the older end of that generation. But uh, when we started seeing a lot of stuff that we'd grown up with destroyed and gone, like tiki bars, like bowling alleys, like drive-in movie theaters, like all this this type of thing that you'd grown up with, and uh, you know, exploitation um, grind houses and stuff like that, there becomes a renewed interest in all this stuff that is is getting torn down and thrown away. This detritus of, of uh, U.S. culture, and uh, tiki was part of that. I joined a band uh, in. Um, in the uh, 1994 that had been around for a couple of years. The, it was originally called the Combustible Edison Heliotropical Mambo and Oriental Foxtrot Orchestra. And they put on a show called the Tiki Wonder Hour. And it was a whole tiki review, like a Las Vegas style review, except it was hosted by Satan. And uh, it took place in hell. And the suffering bastard was uh, one of the comedians. So it was a guy in a paper mache tiki mug and come out and tell really bad jokes and blah, blah, you know, that, that whole type of thing. But they were doing all this sort of exotica music and, and old school film music and that, that type of thing. And uh, they, uh, when they got signed to Sub Pop Records in 1993, uh, when the record was about to come out, two of the guys uh, had day jobs and, and 
couldn't really go on tour. I spent my life going on tour. So they called me and they knew I loved all this music and I could make the drinks and blah, blah, blah. So I went out on the road with them and we saw this whole thing start to for, happen right in front of our eyes. And one was the cocktail revival and the other was this whole Tiki revival. And when we got to Los Angeles, we met uh, members of, I like to call them the LA Tiki Mafia. So uh, I became, uh, oh, hold on, ah, there it is. Good friends with this guy, Otto von Stroheim, who published a, a whole run of the Tiki News magazines that uh, were all sent to my home back in the in the day. But Otto uh, was the first one to really start bringing this stuff back. He had backyard luau parties uh, in, in his Venice Beach uh, home starting around 1988. And of course, two of the folks that hung out at that were uh, Jeff Berry and Sven Kirsten. Uh, and, uh, these guys started to really bring back this stuff and being in Los Angeles where the, uh, Tiki apartment houses and, and the, all sort of the uh, Googie uh, uh, coffee shops and, and the old motels and stuff around, uh, around Disneyland all still existed. Uh, as did a place called the Tiki Tea. Here's a Tiki Tea menu. Uh, this is a little more recent, it's about uh, 13, 14 years old. But uh, Tiki Tea on Sunset Boulevard, uh, was uh, started by a guy named uh, Ray Buen, who uh, was uh, Filipino, and uh, he opened it in 1961, and he had worked at the original Don the Beachcomber. And a lot of these guys had figured out what these recipes were. They were all written in code, like number 11 was uh, cinnamon syrup, uh, you know, things like that. And the labels steamed off. But, you know, you taste things and you can kind of figure out, oh, that's Jamaican rum, you know. Uh, and they maintained their uh, their work. I highly recommend Jeff Berry's book, uh, Sip and Safari, for the entire story of, of uh, how this all happened, how these, these bartenders just moved all around the country and brought the drink recipes with them. But, uh, you know, nobody knew how these drinks really were made outside of those, those people. But uh, Jeff Berry, with assist from Otto von Stroheim, uh, published this in 1995. This is the original... Uh, copy of the uh, Beach Bum Berry Grog Log. The cover here is by Bosco, who was the first guy that we know that was bringing back the carvings. This is one of his uh, tiki mugs right, right here uh, with a Latitude uh, 29 stir in there. Latitude 29 is, of course, the fabulous uh, tropical bar, tiki bar in uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, owned by Jeff and Anine Berry. Uh, this, this book was really cool. You know, it's got all sorts of graphics in it. These sell for about 150 bucks or so on, uh, on eBay. Now there are 450 of them, uh, that exist. And of course the happy hangover right on the back. Uh, he republished most of this, not all of it in the Groglog account in 1997, but this was the first, uh, way that we found out how a lot of these drinks were made because he would continually, Jeff would continually ask Ray Buen, how do you make this? And, and, you know, I used to do this myself all the time to people. How do you, in these bars, you know, how do you make this? Just, rum and fruit juice, rum and fruit juice. That's all they would ever tell you. But one day, uh, Jeff, and he can relate the story in, in his book in his own words, but I'll paraphrase by saying, you know, he was always asking Ray. And Ray finally at, at like age 82 or whatever it was said, you know, I'm not going to take these to the grave with me. Here's how you make them. And here's here's the other guys and you can talk to them and he tracked tracked them all down and he figured out he broke the code so we really for what we do nowadays we have everything to thank to jeff berry because otto and sven sven you know uh, a cinematographer but but really got into the whole architecture and the and the tiki carvings oceanic arts uh in um Whittier, california and uh otto of course the entrepreneur otto had the first uh uh, Exoticon in Los Angeles. I played at that, uh, Combustible Edison played at that in 1995 uh, at the Park Plaza Hotel overlooking MacArthur Park. And uh, I think it was like something like 3,000 people showed up, $11 a, a, a head. And uh, it was amazing. And there was music and there, was, and there were tiki drinks, uh, which Jeff Berry had put together all the recipes at. So this is really the whole start of, of how tiki is coming back. And it's mostly people who are now like me in their 60s or in their 50s, uh, that were interested in the stuff at the time in their, in their 30s and, and 40s that were really like looking for this lost world. And, uh, you know, by the early 2000s, a lot of these places started to re uh, to open, new places started to open. And the, the places that had been around, like we'll say the, uh, the Kahiki in, uh, 
this place was completely over the top, the complete, uh, the Kahiki in Columbus, Ohio. The interior had this huge, like uh, 80 foot high tiki fireplace uh, over this side. And, uh, you know, there was like a, a rainforest and, and a, a whole area of tropical birds flying around. And they had the mystery drink, uh, which they started in 1961, but the Mai Kai had actually started that uh, a year or two beforehand, where you would just say, I'll have the mystery drink. And somebody would just hit a giant gong and your uh, waitron would, would come out with this bowl of dry ice flowing out of it. And they would walk through the, uh, like down the, the center aisle and bring it to your table. And of course, everybody would see that and everybody would then order a mystery drink. The, essentially, the, the poor gong guy was deaf by the end of the night. So uh, bars started to reopen, uh, or new bars started to open and, uh, you know, Smuggler's Cove and uh, was on, uh, 2005 and uh, uh, Motor Susie's, uh, Psycho Susie's Motor Lodge in Minneapolis is one of the first in like 2002. But you know, it's where we are today and uh, we have, uh... oh, I thought I had other menus here. Never mind. Uh, you know, I, I had a zombie village in San Francisco, that, their menu here. But uh, that is how uh, we've got here. Now we have things like Tiki Oasis uh, uh, that started in 2001 that Otto von Stroheim and his, and his, and his wife, Baby Doe had started and there's uh, the Hookie Lao and uh, started in Atlanta, but now in Fort Lauderdale, Tiki by the Sea, which is industry only. Uh, uh, Ohana Luau at the lake in Lake George, which actually uh, I should be at right now, but it ain't happening. And uh, that's kind of it, the rise, the fall, the resurrection, the redemption, and uh, it's back in, in full force. There's, uh, I, you know, I even have a couple uh, new places here, uh, Shore Leave, here in, uh, in Boston, where I was the, uh, I put up together all the music, uh, the playlist for it. So um, I think that's, uh, that about sums it all up. Thanks. Elvis, Elvis, went, Elvis went to Hawaii too. Whoa, yeah. blue Hawaii. You know, <laughs> I had the pleasure to actually go to shore leave um, with the founders of Thirst Boston last year. And they're a, they're a festival partner of ours. We've actually got to bring them up to Drink Atlantic. So any of you that are in the eastern side of uh, the United States, make sure to be able to check out uh, Thirst Boston when they're back up and running another great festival. Um, that was incredible. I mean, I've never gotten so much information in a condensed and just like amount of time. You just like you've forgotten more about Tiki than most know. So I really appreciate. Um, it that takes time to... It's normally ninety minutes. Where if you if you see it, it, Tiki by the Sea. Or I have done this with a lot of USBG uh, uh, around around the the US. And if you are a bartender out there or own a bar and you would like to bring me. Uh, to your town to do the full version of this, which has movies and it's, you know, it's a whole uh, PowerPoint uh, and it's a lot more in depth uh, than, than this was. This is the, uh, the, the 101 version of it. Uh, Tiki by the Sea, as I say, goes on for a good, almost 90 minutes, but uh, uh, you know, you can, you can reach me. Brother Cleve at Gmail. That's it. Brother, brother C-L-E-V-E. -E. It's all one word. Drop me a line. Uh, you know, have rocket will travel. Yeah, that was, uh, that was incredible, and I really appreciate it. We've, we've said to our guests this year at Drink Atlantic, those that have given up their time, and it is a precious thing to be giving up these days, that they have an automatic uh, stamp on their passport ready for next year when we can have them in person. So we can't wait to have uh, Brother Cleve and Shannon in, in Halifax in person next year. So anybody that's in here from Halifax, we'll make sure we can, we can, do, this, uh, we can do this again next year. So we're going to jump into, Shannon's going to take us into, so we've been brought from the start, the, the, the rise, then the fall, now the resurrection, and now we're in current day. And uh, Shannon has a lot of great knowledge and is kind of at the forefront and one of those leaders in, in today's Tiki, um, not even a revival, I guess it would be, you know, continuum. So uh, Shannon, uh, the floor is yours and I can't wait to listen. Well, look, I, I just got to say that, um, you know, is it a new day? Every day is a new day. I'd also like to affirm that this is a good day, right? Because every new day is an opportunity to explore a new possibility. And that's what attracts me to Tiki in the first place. Just want to check. You guys can hear me all right? All right, see a thumbs up. Just so you know, there's going to be a little background noise because I'm at Gladys. 
we're doing takeout, which I'm really excited about, and we're getting up for service. But I just wanted to be here in my home bar and uh, show you guys what it's all about. Um, but all that to say is that where Tiki is right now and where I see it going is kind of like this funny hybrid, you know, like, there's some people in some bars that are very devoted to classics, but I'm starting to see a lot of kind of adventurous outlooks and approaches to making drinks. I'm going to, you know, rattle off a few places that I love that I think are doing a really good job of keeping classic and iconic drinks kind of in the forefront of their mind, but coming up with different ways to combine ingredients, rum, spirits, what have you. To kind of freshen it up a little bit. So, Brother Cleve mentioned Zombie Village. Zombie Village in Dock Park are very dear to my heart. I, I love that they have these grottos within the bar that are each dedicated to a historical bar or to a historical drink, and they just kind of walk you through the history and evolution and the possibilities of the zombie. Uh, I think the thing about Tiki that it's really compelling is that there's a canon. You know, there are iconic drinks that won't go away for a good reason. And so they provide ample, I don't know, learning opportunities and kind of like iconic moments and things that you can just like get sucked into and spend years and years, you know, tr really trying to get to the meat of it. I mean, for me, that's the Mai Tais. We'll talk about that a little later. Um, I love what Selma Slaviak is doing at her new bar called Selma's, which opened in Bushwick recently. She worked with Mother Pearl for some time. She's an author, um, really good heart, works with things like Aquavit in her work, just all over the place. I, I think she works with Swole, you know, so a little bit of plug there for Drifter. Um, I think of someone like Brian Maxwell, who is based in New Orleans right now. Follow him on Instagram, Shaker of Spirit. The man is on fire. I'm like, where's his book? He's come up with 90 original recipes since the lockdown. And so what I'm really loving about Tiki right now is like the kind of like diversity of different individuals who are participating in it and creating it. And then all the different spirits and ingredients that maybe were not widely available um, when Tiki was on the scene for commercial apps so there was a little bit of a limitation there, but now we can basically get our hands on whatever we want. Now, there are some uh, opinions around why that's a good or a bad thing, but it is what it is. So just to segue, um, give you guys a little bit of background information on me and how I got to where I'm at. I'm at Gladys Caribbean right now. This is our renovated space as of last year. Um, I know the video is a little choppy, or it might be, so please bear with me. Um, when we opened this space, the idea was a, a rum bar, not a tiki bar. In fact, I was resistant to the idea. This was six years ago. Um, I work mostly in classic pre-prohibition era cocktails, didn't know much about rum or tiki or anything along those lines. Um, I was given a month to build out this program which needed to have 50 good rums in the back bar as well as the menu. And the, the first place I looked was Cuba, Barra Florida, and the Dakiri is my go-to. Like anybody that's ever served me in a bar knows that it's either that or a glass of sparkling wine. In other words, light, bright, and easy. So I did not have tiki on my mind here, but there was one cocktail that I thought would um, would fit here, you know, in that initial vision, and that was the Mai Tai. A, it was a creative challenge for me, and B, it's an iconic drink that up until recently had been mishandled, if not outright butchered. And I knew that if I wanted to counteract this perception that rum was sweet or tacky or, you know, not worthy of being in a good cocktail, this could be the cocktail to dispel that notion. So I spent a couple of weeks blending a few different rums, coming up with something that I 
thought would replicate what that original cocktail was. I revisited for every menu flip for four years as new products came on the market. Just to give you guys a little context, I opened this bar the same year that Ed Hamilton launched his line. So I was one of the first bars to be able to access those liquids from Worthy Park Estate, from St. Lucia, things that had not been here for a minute. You know, we, we had, you know, Rum GM, uh, we had Bacardi, all, you know, decent, respectable stuff. But for me, I was really pulled in by the hogo. So I'm, I'm rambling, but the, the point here is that I'm inspired by Kane Spirits. They weren't getting a lot of love five or six years ago. I worked in wine prior to getting into the bar. I love the diversity of the category, and I just wanted to tell the best story around it that I possibly could muster, and this is what this bar is about, and that's what the cocktails were always geared towards. How do we let people know what's really good with Kane Spirits? We're not masking it. We're not covering it up. We're going to really amplify what's inherent in liquid and have fun with it as well. I mean, I, I don't even know why I haven't printed this T-shirt yet. I like to say uh, girls just want to have rum. And I think there's another T-shirt coming up called What Would Don Do? WWDD. I think graphically that could be pretty cool. So with that being said, I've just been so inspired by the category, and that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. So um, that gives you a little bit of info on me. Let me tell you about the way I create drinks and how I hope that it's um, offering some new ideas. So, you know, as Rebecca Cleve pointed out, um, Donna Beachcomber was, you know, a very kind of innovative individual. And he tasted a lot of things. He had a really kind of wide ranging creative palette. He was able to make these kind of connections. Think like Malcolm Gladwell, right? You know, these things that don't necessarily fit together on the surface, but if you can have an open mind, then you can see those connections. Um, my approach to making CT cocktails is looking at the icons or the classics. I think any bartender wants to make a good drink, be it tiki, tropical, otherwise, would uh, benefit from looking at the classics because why are they still here after 100 years? They're here because they work, right? So you look at those templates and proportions, you don't have to reinvent the wheel, but you look at yourself and you say, well, um, what do I have now that they didn't have back at that time? What was the intention behind the use of each specific ingredient? And what other flavor ingredient can I use to fill that slot? It's, it's not so much about, some people call it Mr. Potato Head. I, I like to give a little more credit to the ingredients in question than that. You know, it's a little more like, well, how can I show some love to this template? How can I show some love to this idea? How can I show some love to the ingredient I'm going to bring into the mix here? You know, so it's not like a, you know, I, 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 mean, I don't know where you guys are here, but, you know, there's a little bit of cynicism around risk, which I totally understand because, you know, the allegation is that it's not original and it's a little bit lazy. And so, you know, I would hope and inspire you all who are making risks or looking at classics to think about the ingredients that you're using and dedicate yourself to really paying homage to those ingredients and using them for a good reason because you want to show the best of everything that's going into the cocktail. And that's the way I make my drinks. So with that being said, I don't know if you guys are thirsty, but I'm, I'm ready to, to shake some up for you. All right, the pool side. You should have the recipe now. It's inspired by the pina colada. For those of you who are familiar with Gladys, um, you know our painkiller. It keeps the lights on. Here's a little secret. Don't tell my boss. I've never had one. Okay, that's not true. I, ta I developed it. I tasted it, but I don't like sweet drinks. It's, it's just like a big pet peeve of mine. But I recognize the value that that kind of template has. So I wanted to um, go back into that pina colada space 
and evoke this texture, but give it a little more of a dusky kind of like savory element so it's not so sweet. And this is for me. Um, so let's uh, do the cocktail right now. So pina colada, as you guys know, is uh, coconut cream, pineapple, uh, a lightly aged or probably filtered uh, Puerto Rican style rum. It's meant to kind of melt on your tongue really easily and quickly, which is delightful when you're on vacation on the beach. So I'm going to follow the same principle. And in order to kind of like go a little less sweet, but add a little more earth, I'm using banana milk instead of coconut cream. So what is banana milk? I'm going to show you my hack. Hold on. So when I found this product about a year ago, I was kind of, I was like, wow. I wasn't looking for it, but I found it at the store. And I'm kind of like the mad pie that I talked about earlier. I just like find things and I'm like, ooh, what can I do? So banana wave is a puree of bananas, spices, cinnamon. You know, you can find the recipes in the card that you guys got. Um, but the idea is that it gives you that, that feeling on the palate without too much sweetness. This is still a little bit of an earthy element to it. So that is swapped in for the coconut. I'm using ginger to also um, amplify that dusky, earthy element that counteracts the sweetness, as well as a little bit of papaya. Um, my general idea around a lot of drinks when I'm making it is um, what I call shape shifting. Like maybe you thought an ingredient would taste a certain way, but if you kind of, it's almost like how can I change your perspective? How can I change the angle or the vantage point? And then you're seeing something in it that maybe you didn't see before. All right, so without further ado, I'm gonna build it. Um, simplicity is also one of my things that I really love. So everything here apart from the spirit is half, half, half. And that's also a function of running a high volume bar as well. So half ounce of lime, half ounce of ginger syrup, half ounce of banana and so we're going back into that um, Don Beach tradition of marrying various juices and doing that layer situation at that sticky part from other styles and now we've got half an ounce of the banana milk so you know he's also famous for saying that you know what one rum can do we can do even better. I love blending rums. So in this case, I'm going to be using a split between Ed Hamilton's New York blend, which has two rums in it, as well as the Agua Prata. And so now we have a total of three distillates in here. Give a shout out anybody that loves to blend a rum. Um, when I'm making cocktails, I have to have at least two in there unless it's a daphne, but even then I usually do that as well. All right, guys, my sand mixer is bolted to the corner over there, so I'll be right back. All right, here we go. I'm going to strain it here. Maybe I'm lying to myself. I like to think this is a healthiest drink. You guys uh, give a thumbs up if you can still hear me. Good. So um, I'm going to dust it with a little coconut flakes and uh, adorn it with banana chips. Real easy. So yeah, poolside. Um, I wanna taste it and make sure it's okay. I think I did all right. Yes. Wow. All right, so 
you know, just to sum it up, the philosophy is the classics work for a reason. We have ingredients available to us that were not widely available to bars 30, 40, 50 years ago, hence maybe why they weren't utilized. And, you know, in the, the vein of uh, Donna Beachcomber, Trey Vic, it's like, be creative, be a little wild, uh, go nuts with it. I, there's no drink idea I won't try out. You know, I've worked with different friends and developing recipes and I'll float an idea by them and I'm like, I don't know if that's going to work. And I'm like, okay, well, let's find out. You know, that doesn't deter me if it sounds strange or unlikely. In fact, that's what um, draws me into it. You know, to illustrate another example, one of my favorite Tiki Cocktails uses Jägermeister, which has long been shunned by the bar, but I think, you know, kind of change your perspective. Jägermeister is an herbal liqueur that can kind of fill the gap between Angostura bitters, allspice shrimp, and a few other things like kind of like a chocolatey amaro. So rather than using these three elements, you kind of condense them into one. That's another thing that uh, I prioritize running a program like Gladys, which is a small bar. There's 12 seats here and 30 overall in a restaurant, and we just crank. So the question is, how can I take this ingredient and get it to play the function of two or three? The more the merrier for me. And again, it just kind of gives me an opportunity to deepen my appreciation for what's actually there rather than you know just taking someone else's word for it or looking at what that ingredient's been used for prior i'm interested to know but i'm you know very interested to know what else can be pulled out of that you know how how can we mine it so i i know we're going to be closing up pretty soon i got a few minutes as does uh, Brother Cleve to answer any questions that you guys have. But um, yeah, I just wanted to let you guys know, like for me, the way I approach tropical drinks is very ingredients driven, classics, kind of give some clues on how to kind of like structure it. But outside of that, I, I take what I call kind of no holds barred approach. I hate to limit myself I don't think Tiki is about limits. I think it's about exploring. I think it's about traveling. I think it's about new, new, new. And so um, not newness for the sake of it, but I, I think that's why it's such an enduring and appealing tradition, you know, because it just gives you a sense of freedom, or at least that's how I feel. So you guys let me know. Anyway, thank you for joining me here at Gladys. I know for some of you on the West Coast, it's kind of early. It, I hope the mass high is a good way to wake up. And uh, you can follow me on Instagram, at Shannon Mustafer. That's the only platform I use. A little bit of a dinosaur. Um, yeah, follow me. You'll see recipes. You'll see links to articles that I'm writing, you know, features, events, things like that. Um, and thank you, Avocatasa, Drink Atlantic, and uh, thank you all. Thank you. Shannon, that's uh, fantastic. And we want to thank both you and, and Brother Cleve for being here. And uh, we don't want to take up too much of your time. But folks, if you have any questions, um, pop them into the chat. And we'll, we'll, uh, we have a few minutes. Uh, we're going to try to wrap at, at half the hour. So um, we have about eight minutes. Um, a question that I had, I had received coming up to this was, Shannon, what do you typically drink when you write? Straight agricole, straight funk. <laughs> It's like that or beer. It's like six percent ABV or fifty nine, zero to sixty, literally. And brother Cleve, when you're writing a song, what do you drink? I guess it depends on what it is. Uh, but uh, usually, if I, uh, I, you know, I've written a lot of instrumental music and a lot of sort of exotic and and film music. I was the uh, staff composer at the Cinemax Networks for uh, ten years, uh, back in the '90s and early 2000s. Uh, so, uh, aperitifs, sweet things that are kind of light and refreshing. 
if you guys were to take a look at the state of uh, you know COVID and a pandemic and and maybe relate it to um, you know prohibition and how people haven't been able to go to bars, do you think that there's going to be more of a push for that escapism, similar like to a tiki um, trend after this pandemic when people can you know go there? Do you think tiki bars will see a, a, a bit more of a boost or uh, do you think there'll be any changes in the approaches to um, tiki bars or tiki drinks? Well, I had a, a thought regarding how this call for social distancing um, kind of works within the context of classic tiki bar service. And Brother Cleve, you're working right now in a bar that has guests in it. I'm only doing to go, but I'd like your thoughts on this. You know, think about the Mai Kai or these bars that you know, maybe they had a small bar where you could interact with a bartender directly, but the bulk of that drink production was coming out of a service bar, or out of a kitchen. And so who knows who has the space or the means to execute a service like that right now, but I'm curious if social distancing is a must and tiki bars traditionally, you know, don't have a bartender in front of you, but everything's coming out of a service kitchen, is it beneficial to us? Who knows? I don't know. I'm, I'm just curious to see how that would look for us. Yeah, I, I think probably as indoor dining, I, I have a patio at, at my, so I, I, uh, I'm the beverage director at a place called the Paris Seaport uh, uh, Bar and Creperie. It's a French, uh, French restaurant. I, uh, I've been to France probably more than any other country in the world. So I drank my way around France a good 200 times. So I'm a, kind of an expert on all the spirits. Uh, at aperitifs and digestifs there. So uh, we've been sold out every single night and we sold out days in advance and every other patio. This just happened in Boston on Monday. So, and I am just selling, I'm selling cocktails. People aren't coming in and buying wine and buying beer. We're selling lots and lots of French cocktails. So I think the, that idea of escapism and also people are outdoors and they're, you know, they're, they're hanging out with, with friends that they haven't seen. And so it's just a, a mania all over the, the city here. There's an article in the newspaper yesterday. So I would think that as restaurants continue to, uh, to open, I believe in Massachusetts in about two weeks, they're going to uh, allow that. So I would think that that whole idea of the, the uh, escape and the, the good thing about tiki bars is, uh, and as Shannon was pointing out, like, well, not in Massachusetts, but in like, say, the Mai Kai in Fort Lauderdale, where there is all the sort of outdoor seating and tables are kind of spread out already just to give a, a sense of privacy out there. And a lot of tiki bars have the, you know, sort of hidden booths and things like, like that. It's always been that, had that sort of uh, tropical escape vibe to them. So I, I would think that Probably, and I, I know uh, just from what I'm seeing, people are just going nuts that they can actually uh, get out of the house right right now. Um, whether that leads to any further complications down the, the line, I'm not too sure. I'm not a, um, you know, I'm not a psychic, but uh, people sure having a great time right now. And I'm, I'm just, I'm beat. I, I made like 500 drinks last night. I'm working 12 hour shifts. So. <laughs> wow, wow. Um, see, we have a question for Shannon. Um, have you worked with uh, blending native New England ingredients into your tiki program? Native New England ingredients? I have yet to do that. Um, I focus primarily on Caribbean ingredients that come from the kitchen here at Gladys. Um, and then I branched out subsequently to ingredients from Southeast Asia, things that kind of tend to cling to the equator. I hope that answers your question. Uh, I can say that I do because I have a, a dear friend in Maggie Campbell, who uh, is a name that's familiar to very many people. She is the uh, head distiller at Privateer Rum here in Massachusetts. And uh, Andrew Cabot, who founded the, the brand, his the great, 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 great grandfather was a, a privateer, a rum runner during the uh, American Revolutionary War. So it's kind of dedicated to him. So they make uh, fabulous uh, New England uh, rums and uh, they also make a tiki gin uh, that I like to use. So uh, yeah, they're great. And I, I make a tiki, I make one tiki drink I call it Luzon, uh, which is, a, that's actually an island in the Philippines and it is, um, it's got the, their, uh, their amber uh, privateer rum, and then I use uh, calamansi 
juice in that and a, a, a green tea simple syrup and uh, and actually ancho rays uh, the um, uh, not the verde the uh, uh, I'm looking at the bottle right there the uh, the the, re the red chili whatever that's called I'm looking at the bottle I can't delicious. read it. it's delicious if um, if anybody in, in Halifax is is uh, looking to try some Avoa Cachaca or some privateer rum at Dear Friend, the bar that we're opening in Dartmouth. We have both. So we have the Queen Share and we also have the Silver from Privateer. So we'll be able to try that uh, when you stop by our bar. Um, where do you get banana milk? Is it just banana, banana flavored milk? No, it's not. It's actually a puree. So this is prepackaged called Banana Wave. I don't. I bought all of it in Brooklyn. I don't know where else to get it, but um, there's a recipe in my book where you can puree bananas with water and add like cinnamon, clove, and spice, and then strain off the solids. That's a traditional method of preparation. Banana milk is popular in Nigeria because it's um, really good for rehydration, hence why marathoners tend to load up on potassium and bananas prior to a run. Um, yeah, look online, you can find a, a lot of good recipes. So uh, I'm, I'm just going to jump in here because um, I know many, many people have this question. I think it would be a, a little uh, irresponsible not, not to address this. And by the way, um, if everyone sees that Shannon's screen is, is frozen, don't, don't worry. You're, you're not losing it. It's frozen for, for everybody. But thankfully, we can still hear, hear her. Um, Man, you know, I didn't know I was off the grid. I'll, I'll come back and I'm going to troubleshoot that for you. But thank you for pointing it out. <laughs> no worries, Warren. We can we can still see you, which is funny. You're just uh, frozen. <laughs> so um, so, but yeah. Th so th this this kind of intersectional or, or or dichotomous conversation that we now need to start having about how Tiki's um, resurrection is also coupled with our our now understanding of the level of cultural appropriation oh, that catalyzed. that really helped catalyze the category in the first place. Huh? How how do we navigate that and 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 how do we um, you know you you mentioned every day is a new day and I think that's a great philosophy to have um, and this question is for both of you how do how do we manage that and how do we do the justice to the traditions and at the same time help you know create and raise more awareness of of um, of, of some of the darkness of of the fact that there has been a tremendous amount of cultural appropriation that has helped lift this category forward. BC, do you want to go first? Because I'm I'm ready to jump into this. Yeah, I so you know to me it's all Hollywood, but uh, you know these are all I don't know I don't know about appropriation. These are these are symbols. These are uh, you know not real gods will say uh, like in hinduism uh you know uh, nobody believes that a, a real blue skinned person uh you know created these uh, these tales it's and you know saints and things like that so the, they all have different meanings to to different people but uh you know it's it's a hollywood dream basically uh so i'm i'm not really the one to get into this discussion well, I mean, to underscore your point, Brother Cleve, and this is something that I do my best to convey to individuals, like this is, this is entertainment. And at the time that tiki, tropical, exotic drinks, whatever they were called, um, came on the scene, the conversation like, what is culture? Who's the minority? What is that? This language didn't even exist. And so to try to slap on the way we like to think and talk about race and culture on top of it, you know, it, it doesn't make any sense to me. It's just like, let's recognize it for, you know, what it was at the time and not judge it by the same criteria that we would judge it today because we have a different perspective and just say, hey, if you're not comfortable with this idea of cultural or racial appropriation, well, you know, there's some easy solutions for that. We don't use any mugs that have an overt reference to, a, you know, a culture or a race. We use nautical mugs or we use glassware or whatever. 
You know, it's like, I don't think we have to pigeonhole Tiki as like strictly this exploitative thing. In fact, I think it's a very really liberating thing. So we just had to ask ourselves, well, what does that look like in our time right now? I don't think it's that hard. Yeah, I think the whole, you know, there's been a, a, a movement also, to keep, you know, to what is the, what this actually is, it's tropical drinks. You know, like for instance, yeah, when we put this together at, at Shore Leave, uh, my uh, MO on it was music from any place that has palm trees, basically. So anything that gives you that tropical experience. And uh, that's really what it's all about. And then, and, you know, when you're using uh, spirits that are, have a more tropical base, obviously rum is, is sugarcane, uh, you know, originated in, in India and Burma. And uh, that's where it, it came from. Uh, I remember, on, I, so I had a record deal in India. I spent a lot of time there. And uh, I remember going up through the, the northern part of the country and just like cane fields everywhere. And of course, Old Monk, uh, the, the biggest selling rum in, in, in India, uh, which you can find in certain places in the United States. But, uh, you know, it's just like, uh, it's tropical, it's all, you know, the more, usage of the term tropical bars as opposed to tiki bars uh i find really good because that's really what it's about that's sort of tropical you know your escape experience your vacation yeah i mean again i i think that um people can take it a little bit literally and guys forgive me for the the lack of video it's been a kind of friday the 13th moment on a saturday but i can still hear you guys i know you guys can still hear me um, I, I'm just not into the throw the baby out with the bathwater sort of thing. You know, I think people can get a little overly aggressive with the PC ideology. And that to me is kind of ironic. You know, it's like one idea is around being PC is that you accept everyone and that you're fair to everyone, but I don't think it's fair or accepting to dismiss something outright without a conversation. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Really well said as well. Um, and thank you both for, for addressing that because it's, it's something that's, um, you know, um, talked about a lot in conversations in the cocktail world and in, in our industry. And I think that you have both shed a, a really positive light on it. So. And I just, I'll, I'll say too, it, it's not, it, the reason I asked it is because it's not a binary conversation. Um, and I think there's lots of different approaches to it, and I, and I, I think we're 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 richer as a, um, a as an industry as a community of listening to them all and creating a platform for everyone to 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 be able to uh, to share those thoughts because every you know a lot of these co experts like like Shen and 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 brother Cleve do do have their own lens on it as well. So um, so yeah, thank you thank you very much for sharing. Yeah, and I think that's our, our last question in, in case anybody has anything else. But I know that uh, Brother Cleve's got to get to work and Shannon's been at work. And uh, I really, really appreciate on behalf of the Drink Atlantic team, you both sharing your Saturday with us and to the near 60 people that attended today on a Saturday afternoon or Saturday morning, depending on where you're from, is the largest Drink Atlantic uh, seminar that we've ever had. So shouts out to the power of the internet and uh, for everybody being so friendly. Uh, we hope to be able to host you in person next year. And if you want to know more about Drink Atlantic, head to um, drinkatlantic.com or our Instagram at Drink Atlantic. You can hear about our seminars that will be happening every weekend from now until June, July 5th. Yeah, everyone, thank you for Abu uh, Kashasa, the NSLC, CPVA, WSET, and everybody for uh, joining us. We'll see you tomorrow. Have a great Saturday. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Aloha! <laughs> Aloha! That's it.